People still argue a lot about how agriculture happened, but it happened, and it happened at five different places in the planet, at least independently, so in some ways it was inevitable. But once that happened, then people started um, raising grain and became highly dependent on that grain and highly dependent on city living. From the progressivist perspective, adoption of agriculture was inevitable. Of course, ancient people adopted it because agriculture is an efficient way to get more food for less work, right? The life of the hunter-gatherer was what historians have traditionally regarded as nasty, brutish, and short. There is no respite from the struggle that starts anew each day to find wild foods and avoid starving. Agricultural benefits are obvious, and that's why people adopted it. That's how it is in theory, but in reality... Agricultural revolution in terms of the early guys who adopted it, at least, was a terrible mistake. People thought that it was a good idea. People today also look back at the agricultural revolution and think it was a big step forward. Agriculture, for most individuals, was bad news. I would agree that totalitarian agriculture has been a disaster. If it was so bad for us, why did our ancestors decide to start agriculture at all? Well, did they? Until 13 and a half thousand years ago, everybody everywhere in the world was living as a hunter-gatherer, obtaining their food by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants and small wild animals. Hunter-gatherer societies have for the most part been nomadic or semi-nomadic, meaning that they shift camp every few days up to every few weeks or months, and that's because the wild plants and animals on which they depend for food, again, either move or else fruiting and flowering is at different places and different seasons, so hunter-gatherers have to move camp to track their changing food supply. Apparently, hunting and gathering has incredibly high efficiency. Scattered throughout the world, several dozen groups of so-called primitive people, like the Kalahari Bushmen, continue to support themselves that way. It turns out that these people have plenty of leisure time, sleep a good deal, and work less than their farming neighbors. They typically spend less than half of their waking hours in what we might call work, and the rest of the time in repose and in what an anthropologist might call cultural elaboration. Yeah, it's hard, to, hard for people to accept the fact that the more you base your society on agriculture, the harder you work. Because of our ancestors hunting for hundreds of thousands of years, we naturally feel joy and happiness while we hunt or gather. Even the physiology of our bodies became more adapted for hunting rather than work on the field. On the contrary, agricultural activity was perceived as a hard, repetitive and boring job. That's why it feels very alien to our human nature. It was far from paradise, but in many respects their lives were better than the lives of most people after the agricultural revolution. First of all because their jobs were more interesting and, more, uh, and their bodies and minds were more adapted to what they were actually doing. The bodies and minds of Homo sapiens evolved for hundreds of thousands of years in adaptation to life as hunter-gatherers. It's useful, I think, to appreciate in a larger sense how the domestication of plants as farming enmeshed us in an elaborate annual set of routines that organized our work life, our settlement patterns, our social structures, and our ritual life. The crop organizes much of our timetable. For instance, the average time devoted each week to obtaining food is only 12 to 19 hours for one group of bushmen, 14 hours or less for the Hadza nomads of Tanzania. It was in many ways much, much more relaxed than life today. It it's seems to defy intuition. All your food out there planted and go you know, harvest it. You don't have to you don't have to go oh, hunting for it or anything like that. But the fact is that when we were hunting for it and collecting it, you know, we, <laughs> we didn't have to plant it. We just had to go and get it. That's why one bushman, when asked why he hadn't emulated neighboring tribes by adopting agriculture, replied, why should we, when there are so many mongongo nuts in the world? The standard narrative is really making a claim that the first farmers spent a lot of effort to harvest crops and then have a lot of free leisure time until next season. 
But it's easy to forget that when we are talking about primitive agriculture, it was not as effective as the modern one. First of all, we should understand that when we are talking about transition to ancient agriculture, this is not a modern agriculture, when its spike has not 20, 30 seeds, but 2, 3 or just 4 at max. And you should do all the hard work by hands. So the results you will get will be much worse than we have today. In addition, they started practicing fixed field agriculture, which is very hard and labor intensive. Fixed field agriculture is far more labor intensive. Plow agriculture was avoided until population pressure and or a property system forced people into it. And when conditions allow, people exit this form of agriculture. Then they've made things even worse and choose the most difficult type of crop processing one can ever imagine. The first problem is to get the wheat seed from the hard and durable shell. You can't do that without tools, so the whole new industry of stone pestles and mortars must be created. But the main difficulties awaited just ahead. Now you could grind seeds that you've harvested on stone millstones. In fact, the kind of agriculture that early humans practiced was onerous and involved a tremendous amount of work. They did all that hard work, even though you can simply cook porridge from grain without loss in calories and doing less. So what did the first farmer receive in return for their efforts? It is believed that people have solved all their food problems and become independent from vagary of nature. But did they? There are numerous ethnographic researches, there are plenty of such researches, that proves that transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture was extremely unprofitable for an ancient man. A simple analysis of the life of the ancient farmers proves that in many aspects the life got much worse. We started moving a lot less uh, because we were sedentary, we lived in cities, um, we were able to store grain and because we could store grain that was wealth. Because there was wealth there was poverty, uh, there was hierarchy, there were leaders, there were people who were in control which we had never experienced before, there were institutions like churches and government which never existed before. And those things served to organize society and regiment society in ways that we could continue to produce our food. It also had adverse consequences on health. Hunter-gatherer skeletons are much larger because they had fewer interruptions in growth and their bones show almost no signs of malnutrition. If we look at archaeological sites around the world where people have done this, in all the locations, this is not a cultural issue, in all the locations where agriculture began in Asia, in the Mideast, South America and Central America, in every case, archaeologists can find um, skeletal remains of agricultural people and contemporaneous hunters and gatherers, people who lived at the same time. And in every case, the hunter-gatherers were larger, were much taller, they were not diseased, they didn't have teeth decay, all those issues. And if we look at the, at the agricultural people, we will find people who are stunted, short, their teeth are invariably gone because of the carbohydrates they're eating, turn into sugars and rot their teeth out. They're misshapen, they're asymmetrical, they show every evidence of suffering all sorts of disease. It's clear that people outside these grain civilizations were healthier than the people inside. Farmers are now attached to the land they work on, and in the event of adverse conditions, they cannot move to other places like hunter-gatherers did, which causes severe famines amongst them. In fact, hunger as a phenomenon appeared with the first agricultural societies. Hunter-gatherers, if there is some natural calamity, like a drought, then yes, life is worse, but if some plants don't grow like last year, you always have other options. Mm. With farmers, if the yearly uh, um, harvest of wheat or rice is down, there is no other option and you have mass starvation. Moreover, the grain diet itself is health damaging. It doesn't have the variety of micro-elements we need and narrowed the diet that turned out mostly carbohydrates. And on top of that, the diet of most people before the agricultural revolution was significantly better. Hunter-gatherers subsisted by eating dozens of different species of animals and plants and mushrooms and berries and so forth, so they got all the nutrients and vitamins they needed. 
uh, farmers, after agriculture came, subsisted mainly by eating a single crop, like rice in East Asia or wheat in the Middle East, so their nutrition was far worse. To add insult to injury, the first farmers were more vulnerable to epidemics and were suffering from a lot of diseases caused by overpopulation. Now, does this transition to agriculture still look natural and logical? It is clear that it was not. But what could be the true reasons that forced ancient people to switch from traditional hunting to the hard and less efficient agriculture? Go to Gobekli Tepe, you're 7,000 years earlier. The entire area prior to the appearance of Gobekli Tepe is inhabited only by hunter-gatherers. There's no agriculture whatsoever. They haven't built anything ever. And then suddenly, without any background or any preparation, appears this huge megalithic site, which is incredibly sophisticated, that the whole site is actually 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and 7,000 years older. So how do we account for this? Did a group of hunter-gatherers in Turkey wake up one morning, magically inspired, that they suddenly knew how to cut and quarry stone, move blocks weighing in some cases up to 50 tons, create gigantic stone circles in an area with no water, involving bringing a labor force and organizing that labor force and feeding and watering them, to create the world's first perfectly north-south aligned building which involves accurate astronomy, to do all of that and at the same time to invent agriculture because at the same moment that Gobekli Tepe pops up, suddenly agriculture appears in that same region of Turkey. It's obvious to me that that wasn't a group of hunter-gatherers who woke up one morning suddenly equipped with the skills. What we're looking at is a transfer of technology. We know that the first agricultural experiments were started 10 to 12,000 years ago after some global cataclysm that was accompanied with climate change and mass extinction of animals. Maybe this climate link could explain why people started looking for alternatives such as agriculture. In fact, it is not. The thing is, the catastrophe that occurred had global characteristics, which means that not only animals were killed, but humans as well. Less population means that it needs less food to feed themselves. That is what a lot of ancient legends and stories tell us, that after the flood catastrophe, only a small group of people survived. Another thing to consider is that the first reaction of the hunter-gatherers to any cataclysm is the search for food in new places and not an invention of new forms of activity. That was already proven by various ethnographic researchers. And another moment is that nature quickly recovers itself. One group of animals substitute another, and even though it can take an extended period of time, it's definitely less time than to invent, develop and master complex techniques of agriculture. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that during severe natural conditions, people rolled back from agriculture to hunting and gathering. It's simply more effective. Finally, there's abundant evidence from many sites that wherever there has been a dramatic drop in population because of epidemics, war or famine, the remaining population typically shifts toward less intensive, labor-saving means of subsistence. In that case, natural disasters cannot be a true reason for agricultural revolution as well. Any hunter-gatherer has survival skills in the wild. It's not a problem for them. So it's clear that people didn't have any natural reasons to switch to agriculture. But it happened anyway. Why? Ancient legends and stories tell us that transition to agriculture has nothing to do with the development of new ways of food production. It happened under the influence of the third external force. Ancients told about powerful gods from the heavens who came to them and taught them agriculture. And a lot of researchers today came to the same conclusion that agriculture had not economic but rather religious roots. The history of religion is perfectly intertwined with the history of agriculture. That the priest arose at the same time that wheat arose and kings arose. And it was a vehicle for control and for social control. And I'm here to subvert that control. And religion is a part of that. 
And on top of that, they suffered far more from exploitation and social hierarchies. Mm. Only with, with the agricultural revolution do you begin to see the formation of small elites, of kings and priests and soldiers that control and exploit masses of uh, peasants and workers. So from all these perspectives, it seems that the life of the hunter-gatherers, maybe 50,000 years ago, were, at least in some respects, much better than the lives of most people uh, that came after them. Now, we should pay extra attention to the fact of an extremely tight connection of agriculture to religion in all ancient places of its origin. This connection with ancient gods was a driving force that stimulated a lot of the first farming. At the beginning, agriculture was established as a cult. But technology by itself is never enough. You always need to combine technology with cooperation. You cannot invent and produce and use sophisticated technology unless you somehow manage to uh, to build systems of cooperation that unite thousands or millions or billions of human beings. And in order to establish such cooperation, you need a good story. You need an ideological story or a religious story that people uh, would accept, would believe. And it seems like some very good stories were told to the first farmers in the right way and not by abstract but by real gods. The gods who are not spirits, but some representatives of the highly advanced civilization that not only possess agricultural know-how, they knew how to build these systems of cooperation amongst humans. Right now, we are in our expeditions. We are finding traces of the technologies that are much more advanced than the modern one. These are stonework technologies, building technologies, and these are on the big planetary scale. Thus, we deal with the real facts of existence of some ancient civilization on our planet that was not only more advanced than all ancient cultures, but also more advanced than our civilization, because we face the facts of such a high level of technologies. Thus, we have a question about how representatives of such a highly advanced civilization the percept by ancient people like ancient Egyptians or ancient Sumerians, Greeks, and so forth. It is natural to assume they would think about them as the gods. Why not? And in fact, they called them like these gods and described marvelous acts of these gods in their stories. We will not dive into details now about who exactly these gods were, but according to the most ancient myths and legends, they looked and behaved pretty much the same as humans would. The only difference was that their possibilities and knowledge were far beyond that of ancient people. Now imagine these gods reached ancient hunters and gatherers at some point and then granted agriculture to them as literally a gift from the gods. How would the first farmers react? As with any other sacred knowledge, a cult was established. And because of that, people would preserve this knowledge rather than doing their own domestication experiments. Virtually every economic crop that we know of today that's a major crop in world trade uh, was invented by the sophisticated applied botanists. They domesticated all of these plants and historical man has added not a single major plant to this uh, suite of uh, important plants. If we consider the influence of the third force in a form of representatives of the highly advanced civilization, it will fill a lot of gaps in the mystery of transition to agriculture. First of all, the above analysis proves that there weren't any natural reasons for transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. Second, legends and stories explain why we have such an odd variety of cultural wheats that not only don't relate to each other genetically, they didn't grow in regions with a wild wheat. That's because these were brought and given to people by the gods as already domesticated wheats. Third, the version of the gift of the highly advanced civilization can explain the traces of genetic modification of the ancient wheat and the other plants. And there is another interesting fact that came from an unexpected place, linguistics. Linguists noticed that there is a very curious similarity amongst different languages' vocabulary dedicated to religion. 
but most importantly, a giant amount of similar terms that refers directly to agriculture. Specialists are talking about whole sections of words that are very similar to each other, such as cultivation of land, cultivated plants, terms related to harvesting, tools and material for their manufacture. It makes sense, because by granting to people the new technologies, so-called gods would give it some specific names. According to ancient legends and stories across all the places of origins of agriculture, the things that were granted by them are pretty much the same. It is logical to conclude that these gods were representatives of the same civilization. Thus, they use the same specific terms in their language. This can answer the question of why we have similar agricultural terms across different languages and amongst different cultures that in fact were not in contact before, because these facts have one common ancient source. Agricultural revolution might look like it does a positive impact on human civilization, thus gods were acting as progressors to less developed hunter-gatherer societies, stimulating development of humankind in general. But the facts are that they did it in their own interests. Moreover, it put a hard toll on the people. Mesopotamian myths are very straightforward about the goal of humans' creation. We were created so gods can lay all the hard physical work on us. We were slaves. The fact that humans were created as slaves was not something new or special for ancient people. In prehistoric times, the revered deity was called Lord, Sovereign, King, Ruler, Master. Some of the words that are traditionally translated as worship actually have the meaning of work. Ancient man did not worship his gods. He worked for them. At the same time, we rapidly increased our need for humans. People usually put that backwards. They say agriculture allowed population increase. What really happened is we had a need for excess humans because agriculture is dependent on stoop labor. A whole lot of poor people who go out and do the work to feed rich people. So that kind of social inequity began almost immediately with agriculture. Hunter-gatherers are famous for having their communities based on the principle that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. But increased population because of agriculture demands new structure for society. The interesting thing about hierarchies, about the rule within hunter-gatherer camps, the interesting thing is there is none. How might one tell the story of how we as a species uh, were assembled in great clumps growing grain, tending livestock, and governed by the political units we call states and empires. One led to another. Increased population demands new political units, states, that according to the legends and stories were also established by the representatives of advanced civilizations through religion in all religions of ancient agriculture. That has to be done in order to control and manage the first states. Once the gods established early agricultural societies, they created the basis for systematic class distinctions that could be perpetuated between generations. And that's how you get the kinds of massive hierarchies and inequalities we see today. All of these things, of course, make it more difficult for these plants to thrive in the wild. We have created then with these plants a kind of floral zoo of basket cases which we have to defend every day against the wild lest they not survive. They need our constant attention. We think of ourselves, Homo sapiens, as the agent in this narrative. We domesticated the potato, we domesticated maize, rice, etc. But if we squint at the matter from a slightly different angle, it's we who have become domesticated.